The other day I released a series of videos comparing the most secular countries on earth with the most religious ones, and then I divided it out by religion and compared the most Muslim countries with the secular countries and the top Christian countries on earth with the secular countries. And in this video I wanted to break down my methodology, how I selected the countries that I chose and why, as well as talk about a couple of different caveats and answer some questions that some of you have put forth to me in the last couple days since I released those videos. The the first thing I want to cover is why I made these videos. Specifically, it was in response to these accusations that I get all the time, you know, my, myself being non-religious, being an atheist, I hear people say that atheism or secularism is the downfall of nations, that as soon as a country abandons their faith or abandons God, then it's the decline of that country. And what I've found is since I studied political science at Texas A&M, I've had the opportunity to look at a lot of this data over the course of the last decade, and I knew that that wasn't the case, but I'd never made a video addressing these claims and actually laying the data out in a way that people could easily look at and realize that, wow, secular countries actually perform significantly better on almost every single metric compared to countries that uh, stifle free inquiry or um, hamper individual rights. So. By creating this video, hopefully I'm giving you guys a powerful resource that you can share the next time someone makes that claim or, or says that. But if they come back and they say, well, hey, why didn't he include China in that list? Or why didn't he include the United States? That's what this video is meant to address. Uh, so like I said, the number one response that I've gotten from people who are um, opposed to my research or who've said that I didn't do it fairly or accurately, the first thing that they've pointed out is I didn't include China, I also didn't include North Korea, and I also didn't include the US. So first off, why did I not include the United States in the list of religious countries? You know, the US is extremely wealthy, it ranks fairly highly on most of these metrics, but the US is far from the top most religious country or most Christian country on this list. Most of these countries, if, if you'll take a look at them, I have them sorted here by religiosity, these countries are, you know, 99%, 100%, 96% religious. Um, you compare the Christian countries, you know, the, the least Christian country on this list is still 95% Christian. By comparison, in a recent survey in the US, uh, it found that the US is only about 65% Christian and about 20 or 25% or more unaffiliated or secular or non-religious. So, you know, if I'll, I'll pull this over, this is, um, I mean, obviously this is Wikipedia, so it's not necessarily the most reliable, but if you follow these sources, you'll get similar results in, you know, according to Pew or Gallup or whoever, um, it's it has, you know, the U S listed as about 26% unaffiliated. And this is based off of data from 2019. And I, I believe I saw this exact, um, study in Pew Research, and it's showing that there is a decline in religiosity. Even if you go back to 2009, you know, there's still, you know, about 15% or so that are, are unaffiliated, you know, certain percentage are, um, you know, from different religions. But even in terms of religiosity, it's nowhere near the 96% that we're seeing with the other countries here listed in this survey in terms of most religious. So as you see, the, the most religious countries are, you know, as high as 100%, as low as 96% religious, according to this um, particular Gallup poll. Now, the other caveat when it comes to countries that I didn't include, why did I leave off North Korea? Well, North Korea is not exactly a country that you can just waltz in with a clipboard and start asking questions. So when it comes to statistics on GDP per capita, on uh, the Gini index, or you know, which ranks income inequality or freedom score, you're not going to be able to get accurate data. You're not going to be able to go in and, and actually figure this stuff out easily. So it's, it's not, uh, it wasn't even included in the list of countries that um, Gallup polled in 2009. And the same goes for China. Now, China, you can get data and you can get, you know, a little bit more reliable data. It's a little bit more open than North Korea, but it's still not one of the countries that was polled by Gallup. Now, you could say that that throws off the statistics, but you should also note that Norway also wasn't included in the list of countries polled, nor was Ethiopia. Now, Ethiopia is about 99% religious and ranks very poorly on most of these metrics uh, measuring well-being. And Norway, uh, a previous year, came in at 81% not religious, so it was one of the least religious countries in the world. And it has 
consistently ranked almost at the very top in terms of freedom, low levels of corruption. Um, it, it's very good at, in terms of income inequality. It has an extremely high amount of wealth in terms of GDP per capita, low homicide rates. So it kind of offsets China. So, so when you, you take all of that into account, it's like, okay, am I really cherry picking the data? If I was, I would have included Norway. I would have included Ethiopia. You know, it, it's it's not like I'm going through, you know, I, I set out ahead of time deciding which countries I would and wouldn't pick. North Korea also is arguably one of the most religious countries in the world. How can I possibly say that? It's not Christian. It's not Muslim. But let's compare it, for example, to ancient Egypt. In Egypt, no one would say that Egypt wasn't religious. And yet they worshipped the pharaohs who were still alive. They were the leaders. They were the, the authoritarian dictators who controlled every aspect of society. And they were deified and worshipped as a god. By comparison, North Korea has compulsory worship. They have songs and praise of their leader. The, the current person who's in charge, uh, Kim Jong-un, he's not even the president. You know, he's, he's the supreme leader, but he's not the president. The president is still his grandfather. Even though his grandfather has been dead for decades, the man is worshipped. It's, it's a dynastic dictatorship similar to, to ancient Egypt, but the, the kinds of mythology that they formed around these, the, I would say a cult, cult of personality, but it's way too big to be a cult. There's over 25 million people now that adhere to it and worship the leader who's long since been dead. Most cults, cult leaders are still alive. In this case, you know, they, they have this system set up where they, they formed these myths around it. Like Kim Il-sung, the, the previous leader, had these stories told about his birth, that there was a double rainbow, that a new star formed in the sky, that he was born on this celestial sacred mountaintop, that he scored something like, uh, it was 11 hole-in-ones on an 18-hole course, that he wrote 1,500 books while he was in college, and a couple years later wrote six operas in two years. Like, these are insane mythological uh, type stories that they're telling about their leader, who they worship. Furthermore, they believe that he is their sole savior that can protect them from the West. At the drop of a hat, he can protect them from the United States. They even believed that Kim Il-sung didn't defecate. Like th these aren't people who are practicing you know, skepticism and who are, are practicing um, critical thinking in order to, to figure out, hey, there's probably not a god. No, they straight up worship this guy and they're controlled to do so in the same way that many uh, Islamic states will control what people think and believe and practice. But why did I limit myself to the 114 countries that Gallup polled in 2009? Well, first off, there isn't a single year where every single country on earth has been polled with the same survey question asking about religiosity. So this was one of the largest polls ever conducted. Now, why would I not take data from multiple years from, you know, Pew surveys or Gallup surveys or something across uh, multiple years? Well, first of all, these aren't yearly surveys. It's not like I can grab data from 2009 and 2010 or 2008 and 2009. Oftentimes these surveys, because they take a tremendous amount of effort, they may only run these surveys once every several years. And if I were to grab data from different surveys from say a Gallup poll and a Pew survey, and I were to combine the data together, the questions asked are often very different and yield different results. For example, if I ask, do you believe in God versus are you an atheist? Even if I'm asking the same sample, if I'm asking the same people in the same country in the same year, I'm going to get different results because the word atheist is often stigmatized and it's often seen as, you know, oh, these are people who are immoral. And you can say that that's fair or not, but it, it does skew the results. And a great example of this was there was um, a psychologist, Dr. Will Gervais, who ran a study where he wanted to see what percentage of Americans actually are atheists and don't believe in God. So instead of straight up asking people, are you an atheist, which according to like Pew surveys and stuff, it will only yield about two to 5% on average. He instead had a list of like five different things like, you know, have you ever been to New York? Do you eat meat? Things like that. And then he would have all of those same questions and um, ask also, do you believe in God? And when he would pose those questions to a massive group of people, he would kind of get an average of, you know, how they would put a number. I identify with five of those things. I identify with four of those things. And when he threw in the, I don't believe in God, he got numbers that were as high as around 26%. Now, this is the same type of methodology that they use to kind of determine what percentage of the population are uh, pedophiles or sex offenders or things like that. Because it's a way that people can be honest without outing themselves or feeling like they're being outed because it's an anonymous way to get kind of an over overall average estimate for a population as a whole. That said, a question 
in a poll that says, you know, is, is religion an important part of your daily life? It's not going to give the exact percentage that are atheists per se, but it's going to give you an idea, a rough estimate of which countries are the least and which are the most religious, which is why I went with this particular survey. Now, I didn't rely on government surveys and government polls because oftentimes, especially if you're in a corrupt regime or an authoritarian regime, then the government can skew the statistics to yield a particular outcome that they want. An example of this is China, who even as recently as this year has locked up you know, millions of Uyghur Muslims in concentration camps. And another example of this is Saudi Arabia, where apostates and um, ex-Muslims and atheists are oftentimes persecuted. So when the government polls the population in Saudi Arabia, they get a number of like 99% Muslim, you know, the country's you know super, super Muslim, but when polled anonymously by outside polling agencies, they'll get numbers as high as 20% non-religious and 5% atheist, which is very drastically different from the, the government polling agency. So that's why I stuck with the 114 people who were polled by Gallup in 2009. But as I said before, someone answering no to the question, is religion an important part of your daily life, could be culturally Christian, for example, and they could believe in God, but never pray or set foot in church outside of their infant baptism and their funeral. And conversely, there are countries like Thailand, which ranks as one of the most religious countries in the world, but it's 95% Buddhist. Religion is an extremely important thing for them, but a good chunk, if not most of them, don't believe in a God or gods because you can be an atheist and be a Buddhist at the same time. Now, the other caveat when I was selecting countries, and I, I made this decision before I started um, going out and gathering data and, and stuff, because I wanted to make sure that I wouldn't be accused of cherry picking and choosing countries in order to skew the data a particular way, is I made up my mind ahead of time that I was only going to choose countries that are on the United Nations list of member states. And this includes 193 countries. These are generally agreed upon as uh, countries, as opposed to self-governed territories that may have recently gone through some kind of civil war or turmoil or conflict and are fighting for nation state status. Those uh, territories, they may become countries, but I didn't want to skew the data against countries that may not have a good rule of law in place. They may not have good law enforcement in place, but it's not really fair because they're brand new and they're emerging countries. So I, I stuck to the 193 member states. This actually wound up skewing the data in favor of the religious countries versus the non-religious because on the list from uh, Gallup, included it included Hong Kong and Somaliland. And if you look at this, Hong Kong is only about 24% religious, but it ranks really, really well on almost every single metric compared to Somaliland, which was also on the list. And it's, it's technically a territory. It's not a UN member state though yet. And as recently as 2009, it had conflict with Puntland. It's extremely poor. It's a developing country. And by not including both of these countries, you know, I, I stuck with my caveats from the get-go of my methodology from the get-go of how I was going to choose countries, even though I'm not religious and I personally am biased. And I'll admit that bias up front. Like I don't want religious countries or I don't want atheist or secular countries to look bad and horrible but I'm still going to present the data in the most honest, open way that I possibly can, which is why I, you know, followed my um, methodology that I set from the, the outset. And finally, when picking countries, I also limited it by countries that have a population size of 100,000 or more. And the reason that I did that is because some of these different metrics, like homicide rate, is based on the number of homicides per 100,000 people. If you have a country that only has 25,000 people, then let's say that it has 10 years in a row where there's no murders, and then all of a sudden one person you know kills five people, then it's going to seem like it has this astronomically high murder rate that year or homicide rate that year, when in reality, it's just that the population size is super, super small. So it's not really a fair comparison. So I limited it to countries that have 100,000 or more people. I laid that out from the very beginning, and then I stuck to it. Now, while I was measuring 10 different metrics of success and well-being, one of the things that I did not measure was the percentage of rapes. I used homicide rate to look at violent crime, but the reason that I didn't include rape statistics is because there isn't a unified measurement. For example, there's 
reported in 2002, there were 0.3 rapes per 100,000 people in Saudi Arabia compared to 73 per 100,000 in Sweden. Does that mean that Sweden is the rape capital of the world? No. They're reported very, very differently. Sweden is the rape reporting capital of the world. And part of the reason for this is that oftentimes in Muslim countries, rapes go unreported. And part of that is that under Sharia, a woman's testimony is worth half that of a man. So in some countries like Afghanistan, under Zina, which is the Islamic law that deals with unlawful sexual intercourse, women can be punished as fornicators. And so there's incentive not to come forward. There are also cases like in Saudi Arabia, there was a, a famous case called the Katif case, where a woman was, she was out in public, she was in a car with this guy, and they were basically attacked and raped by a group of people. And the woman got punished for being in public with a man who wasn't her husband or who wasn't one of her male guardians. And so there's this stigma towards women and there's this, this stigma towards reporting rape. And even when they do report it, oftentimes they'll get punished or something like that. And so it's by comparison, you look at a country like Sweden where the definition of rape is just sex without consent. And when a woman reports multiple rapes from a single person, it's counted as, um, multiple rapes rather than just one instance or one occurrence of rape. So the, the numbers are higher compared to Saudi Arabia, where the definition of rape is different and the reporting of it is different. And there's no such thing as marital rape, because if, if you are married to someone, you're basically, they're entitled to your body. So it's, it's not really a fair comparison when the way that they're reported, the definition and the, the stigma against, um, coming forward and reporting these crimes is so much different between different countries. So that's why I didn't go with uh, rape and I went with homicide rate instead. A couple other caveats with the World Happiness Report, the data there only goes back to 2012. I tried to pull every single piece of data from 2009 that I could. Unfortunately, I was limited. I, I chose 2009 because it was a year that had um, a massive Gallup poll that pull, pulled countries on religiosity at the same year that it had, there was a Pew Research poll that asked people whether or not they identified as Muslim, as well as a Pew Research poll asking people whether or not they identified as Christian. So I was able to grab a slice of time that asked all three of those questions from different surveys. And yes, I did use different surveys when it came to different questions. So you don't want to use different surveys to get data for the same question because you're going to get skewed results, but I use different surveys for those different questions. Now, I chose 2009 because it had all of those surveys at the same time with a massive sample size. And also, you don't want to pick data that is like the same year. as if, if I were, for example, to pick data from 2019 or 2020, a lot of times the data isn't entirely in yet for recent years. And so you're somewhat limited in terms of what's available, whereas a year like 2009 is going to have data available for, across a wide variety of different sources. Now, the World Happiness Report only had data back to 2012, so there is a little bit of margin for error there, and I want to be upfront about that. Uh, the literacy rates also, I grabbed most of them from 2009, but if you'll look here at uh, my data, I do include the year that it was measured here. Um, now, some of these, what, basically what I did was I looked for 2009, and if it was available for 2009, I put it in there. And then I would go through and I would look, is it available for 2010? Because I'm trying to get as close to 2009 as possible. If it was available for 2010, I'd put it in. Then I'd go back one year, 2008. Was it available? Put it in. Because 2010 and 2008 are only off by one year from 2009. Then if it wasn't available in 2008, I'd look, is it available in 2011? Is it available in 2007? And I would kind of stagger it year by year like that, trying to get as close to 2009 as I could. And, you know, granted, the literacy rate is going to fluctuate some. On average, literacy rate, unless there's a major conflict or a major war or something, literacy rate tends to go up. It tends to go up, you know, until it reaches 99, 100%. So the fact that a lot of the, the countries in you know the least religious countries, the Christian countries, the Muslim countries, a lot of these are from more recent years, 2014, 2012, 2010, 2010, 2014. A few of them are from earlier. So this one's from 2003. It's not really a fair comparison, but the ones that are, are from later years, they 
tend to be higher. So it's actually going to be skewed a little bit in favor of countries where I was only able to pull from a later year because that gives them more time to raise their literacy rates. For the non-religious countries, because a lot of them were more developed, I did have better data from, you know, 2009 or 2008. There are a few that are that are from more recent years. Um, Latvia has been around 100% for, you know, well since before 2009. Um, so that really hasn't fluctuated much. Um, and then, and the same with Estonia, it's been at a hundred percent for, you know, 2009 and earlier. I just, from the, the data source I was gathering from, from the world bank, um, this was, this was all that was available. Now, one of the caveats that I mentioned in my video on Islam was that the homicide rate is often underreported. And I wanted to give you just a quick example of that. I've got here listed the, the homicide rate and you've got next to Somalia, it says 1.5 per 100,000. That is astronomically low. Why is it that Somalia has one of the lowest homicide rates? If you know the first thing about Somalia, you know that it has been riddled with civil war. It has been ruled by tribal warlords. It has had basically bordered on anarchy and it's not a safe place to live by any stretch of the imagination. So a couple things to point out is one, homicide rate does not include um, deaths from war. It also doesn't include deaths from terrorism. So like suicide bombings or you know people shooting up a marketplace. It only counts homicide rate. The other thing is that when you have a, a system of government that's you know kind of fragile, reporting on things like homicide rates, they're not necessarily the top priority for a government to implement. You know, they're not gonna necessarily have the best statistics. So it's gonna be underreported. So I just wanted to lay that out there to as far as why I said what I did. One other question I've been getting from you guys is why did I just look at the top Christian countries and the top Muslim countries and not look at other massive religions like Hinduism or Buddhism? And one of the reasons for that is I actually did pull the data on Hindu countries, but there are only three countries in the world that are majority Hindu. And they're only 81%, 80%, and 56% Hindu. So these aren't like 99 or 95% Hindu. But even then, looking at the data, they still rank significantly worse than the non-religious countries on every single factor except for homicide rate. And they actually had slightly less homicide than the non-religious countries. Now, is that, does that mean that Hinduism is less violent than countries that are secular? I would say that this number is close enough that it's well within the margin of error and you only have three countries. So it's a very small sample size. That said, um, there's the data that I have on Hindu countries. I haven't analyzed the Buddhist countries. There aren't actually a whole lot of Buddhist countries in the world. If you look here, I know that this is Wikipedia, but if you look at um, the data that they've pulled from a uh, Pew survey, there's only like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven countries that are more than 50% Buddhist. So again, it's, it's not nearly as big of a sample size as getting, you know, 20 of the top Christian or 20 of the top Muslim countries. I could run this analysis, but again, I can tell you just off the top of my head that Cambodia, Thailand, Burma, or Myanmar, you know, like these aren't exactly countries that are massively outperforming the, the secular countries. I'm going to get the same result. Uh, if, if you really want me to do a video on Buddhist countries, I can, but there's, there's not as big of a sample size here. It's up to you. Let me know if you want to see that video. After I release my videos, a number of you are asking what causes what does do countries become more stable economically and then they become less religious because they're more comfortable and they don't feel a need to use religion as a crutch to alleviate their suffering? Or is it the other way around that they become secular and then that leads to prosperity? And there actually was a recent attempt not too long ago in a, a study that was attempting to disentangle correlation from causation. And I'm going to share this uh, in the description below. So I encourage you to go and, and read it and check it out. But it actually found that countries tended to become more secular first before their rate of economic growth increased. Now, obviously their economy is constantly growing, but the rate of growth um, improved with secularization, but it actually found a stronger connection between the increase in tolerance for individual rights and increased economic activity. So what I think that this study seems to indicate is that when you grant people personal freedoms, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of press, then it allows them to go out and talk about these things without fear of, you know, falling prey to some kind of blasphemy law or being locked up for their beliefs. And so it invariably leads to an increase in secularism, but it also leads to an increase in things like fundamental human rights, women's rights and stuff, which 
always has a positive economic effect. So I'll post this link to this study in the description below, as well as the link to the study done by um, Dr. Will Gervais and um, any other resources. My data and stuff is already online and I'll have the links to the last three videos. If you've missed them, uh, you can go and check those out. If you want to discuss this data further in depth, I'll be on Discord. I'll have a link to that below as well. Thank you so much to everyone who has been supporting me through Patreon, Subscribestar, and PayPal. And I will see you guys in the next video. Till then, dare to be curious, but don't drink the Kool-Aid.